Juliet from Zambia too. Abhinav, you can go ahead and introduce Dr. Ortiz. Hello everyone. Welcome to Health for the World International Radiology Grand Rounds for this week. Please feel free to introduce yourself on the chat as you have been doing, tell us where you are from. Um, so the topic for today's Grand Rounds is spinal infection. Um, it's an honor and it's an honor for me to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Aldan Ortiz. Dr. Ortiz is a professor and chair of radiology at Jacoby Medical Center. Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York. He's an alumni of Harvard Medical School, and he served as the eighth president of American Society of Spine Radiology. He's a widely published author in the field of image-guided spine intervention, and we are very grateful he's here today. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Ortiz. Thank you very much, Avana, for your kind introduction, and I thank everyone in the audience. Um, what I'd like to do in this session is really uh, have you uh, be able to relate the pathophysiology of spine infection to observable imaging findings, to combine the clinical and imaging findings in order to raise the possibility of spine infection as a diagnosis, and to discriminate spine infection from other imaging mimics. So what is spine infection? It's a very uh, generic term. And let's get specific. First, it's an infection that can involve one or more spine structures. If it's the vertebra, we call it osteomyelitis. If it's the disc, discitis, um, and so forth. Um, when it's involving multiple structures or compartments, we use terms such as infectious spondylitis, spondylodiscitis, and discitis osteomyelitis. So it's important to at least be aware of some of these terms because they're often used loosely, particularly in the clinical domain. Now, the key aspect of spine infection that we have to acknowledge is that the incidence of spine infection is increasing over time. And there's several reasons for that. And, and, and this is particularly applicable to adults. Um, number one, uh, the factors in clinical presentation involve virulence of organism. And number two, host resistance, including age. And we have an aging population, chronic illness. We have more patients with chronic illness who are living longer. Uh, recent surgical procedures and interventions. We have a lot of that going on as well. And immunosuppression, there are lots of new, I call them abs, this ab, that ab that are out there that people are on for their various chronic inflammatory conditions or uh, oncologic conditions. And because of this, uh, there's increasing risk for uh, spine uh, infection. Additionally, our diagnostic techniques have gotten better, particularly our application of MRI. And so we have better diagnostic techniques, uh, increased exposure to hosts and an aging population. This is, I think, uh, overall contributing to this increasing incidence. What are the routes of infection? Pre-existing infection in the urinary tract, respiratory tract, uh, hematogenous spread, very important to be aware of this, We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, and uh, this is an example of hematogenous spread uh, to the, the cervical spine uh, in a patient uh, with a previous uh, scrotal abscess as shown on the gallium scan on the bottom right. Direct inoculation, whether it's penetrating injury, uh, self-injection self from intravenous drug use, uh, interventions, and certainly the number of spine interventions has increased dramatically over the pa past decade. Uh, spine surgeries have also increased over the uh, past decade. What kind of organisms are we dealing with? Well, certainly gram positives are a biggie. I'm not going to name every single species here, but the one to remember is Staph aureus because that's the most frequently encountered pathogen that we deal with. A uh, special shout out here to the low virulence organisms because they, these can be harder to find. And we're developing some new DNA sequencing techniques that might help us with this 
and more to follow on that as the literature progresses. Non-pyogenic infections, a big problem, including here in the United States, particularly in New York, where we have a very transient and migratory population. TB is still around millennia later. It's still around. Uh, this patient here gives us another type of, of infection. Uh, they present with leukemia. There's a concern for leukemic infiltration of the thoracic spine as shown on the MRI and on the CT scan. And actually, uh, when this patient gets biopsied, it turns out to be a uh, cryptococcal infection. So fungal species, particularly in endemic areas. Parasites, also from endemic uh, areas, are to be considered. The clinical presentation, relatively nonspecific back or neck pain. So you're, you know, you're going through a lot of cases trying to figure out what's going on. Fever, only in half the cases. And certainly we get very concerned when patients present with neurologic deficits, and that means that the disease is fairly advanced. The clinical presentation, well, patients often present uh, beyond three weeks, and a lot of them beyond three months. So the clinical presentation is often delayed. What is that telling you? Well, you're gonna see a lot of significant findings on the imaging, if indeed there is spine infection. Abnormal laboratory parameters, very helpful. Very helpful to get what I call an infection profile, a set rate, a C-reactive protein, and get a white count. Uh, in many patients, if you're suspecting spine infection, it's also very important to get blood cultures because they can be positive about one in one, one out of four times. And that's very, very key because it can, it can get you to diagnosis faster and avoid an unnecessary invasive procedure, i.e. a biopsy. Now, the diagnosis of spine infection is based on a triad of clinical suspicion, imaging evaluation, and microbiologic confirmation. So you got to check off all of those. Well, with respect to microbiology, we keep in mind that there are certain pathogens that have a predisposition to certain locations, for example, bacterial infections within the uh, end plates of the, of the spinal axis, uh, within the epidural space of the spinal axis, uh, echinococcus, for example, a predisposition to the paraspinal musculature and other muscles in the body. Neurosystem psychosis within the cord or the subarachnoid space, and uh, viruses within the spinal cord. Host factors, again, uh, play a big role in this because if resistance is altered, say, for example, a prior spine intervention, a prior surgery, if there's contiguous spread, these are key. With respect to spine anatomy, I want to emphasize that in terms of arterial supply, the terminal arterioles are located within the vertebral end plates of the vertebral body in adults. In children, they would extend in, into the disc, and that's why discitis in children affects the disc. Discitis osteomyelitis, that's hematologically spread in adults, affects the end plate first. And this is an important principle because this is what's going to influence the imaging findings, especially early on. And I'm going to show you examples of that. The epidural space is another prominent area where infection can occur because there's a venous plexus that's very rich throughout the spinal epidural space. So in general, respect to hematogenous spread to these highly vascular end plates, we get the infection first located within the end plate and then extending either to the disc subligamentous, paraspinal soft tissues, epidural space, posterior elements. Imaging. What do we see on imaging first? Well, number one, radiography in general is insensitive to acute spine infection. Radiographs are often normal. But as we move on over time, we get to see, as in this case, just a couple of weeks later, erosion and destruction at the disc and plate level, even in a patient with degenerative disc disease and lumbar spondylosis. And with time, the findings are easier to identify 
For example, the Scott lateral radiograph from CT examination shows advanced loss of disc height and end plate destruction in a patient with spine infection. Nucleus and typography, uh, some of these agents um, have variable sensitivities and specificities for the diagnosis of spine infection. Uh, at our institution, we tend to use gallium. We have moved away completely from, from indium for spine infection. We will use indium for joints and other parts of the musculoskeletal system. But in general, we tend to use gallium at our institution for spine infection. Uh, the challenge uh, with some of these uh, studies such as bone scans um, and gallium scans is that they lack anatomic and clinical specificity. Uh, this is an example of a gallium uh, uh, spec study uh, in a patient with a uh, spine infection. Notice that the study is not sensitive to the epidural abscess that is present uh, in this patient. And uh, the facet joint abscess is very clear uh, in this patient as well. So again, challenges with respect to anatomic and clinical specificity. Attempts to combine these studies uh, have in, in, a, in an effort to increase sensitivity and specificity have met with variable success. Again, the challenge there is having to use two agents, uh, increasing radiation exposure to the patient and also increasing the cost and the duration of the test. Remember, a gallium scan is not a study that takes one day. It can take a couple of days. One new nuclear medicine study that is enjoying specific applications for the diagnosis of spine infection, believe it or not, is FDG-PET. And it is very sensitive and very specific for this diagnosis as in this patient with multifocal spine uh, and, and uh, hip joint infection patient with uh, tuberculosis. Uh, in any event, uh, we tend uh, to now utilize FDG-PET for patients who are unable to undergo MRI and patients with spinal instrumentation. CT. Uh, just like radiography early on can be uh, limited, but as uh, time goes by, you'll see end plate destruction, soft tissue, uh, fullness and thickening. You may see abscesses if contrast is given for a scan, and you may identify areas of calcification and soft tissue thickening. MRI certainly is the gold standard for evaluating spine infection, very sensitive and specific gives great anatomic specificity and allows us to assess for possible neurologic compromise. It's important to keep in mind that the MR scan can remain positive and can look quite nasty, even though the patient is being successfully treated. And so sometimes some our clinicians get scans prematurely on these patients as follow-up, and they think the patients are not responding to the treatment. And I, and I keep reminding them that we treat the patient not the imaging study. On MRI, we look for hypointensity both in the uh, disc and in the end plates. And we look for what I call loss of the disc end plate margin. And I really want to emphasize this. Look at the sharp end plate of that vertebral body, a, a nice, thin, uniform black line. Look at the end plate at the abnormal vertebral body. We don't see it, and that's on T1. A similar finding on T2. We also lose the intranuclear cleft in this patient as well. Contrast enhancement can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. It could be thick or thin. Uh, additionally, at uh, one point, if, uh, if diffusion-weighted imaging is used as part of the evaluation, it could be extremely helpful to distinguish uh, spine infection from other spine infection mimics, such as uh, degenerative disease and reactive end plate change, uh, type one uh, reactive end plate change with fibrovascular replacement 
of the uh, end plate. And sometimes they can be relative to sparing, uh, even though here the disc is deformed, I'm not so sure how spared this disc is, but the height is not lost. So that's why we call it disc bearing here in this patient uh, with uh, tuberculosis. Uh, we can eventually get loss of this height, uh, kyphosis, and plate destruction, material body height loss, deformity, and kyphosis uh, in these patients. We can also have paraspinal soft tissue finding, as in this patient with contiguous spread uh, from an infected kidney, or in the uh, patient on the right with echinococcal disease within their soft tissues and paraspinal uh, musculature. And we can identify that quite these findings quite nicely on MRI examinations. In addition uh, to the findings at the vertebral body and disc and paraspinal soft tissues, we look at the spinal canal and we can identify uh, epidural collections with associated mass effect upon the spinal cord and abnormal cord signal as shown on this T2 sagittal image second from the left. Uh, we can identify the uh, enhancing uh, abscesses in this patient. Keep in mind that the abnormal signal in the spinal cord in this patient is due to two phenomena. Number one, the mass effect from the epidural abscess, and number two, the associated uh, venous conge congestion and stasis uh, with impaired uh, uh, flow within the spinal cord and veno ischemic change in the spinal cord. You can also get extension, not not only into the epidural space, but into the meninges in general. And this is a, pa this is a patient rather uh, with extensive enhancement uh, in the spinal canal involving all the meninges uh, completely uh, surrounding uh, the lower spinal cord, a patient with epidural abscess and meningitis. So that's a really advanced case in that particular situation. Uh, you can get a sparing of the vertebral body and disc and isolated involvement in the spinal canal as, uh, as exemplified in patients who have, for example, uh, neurocystosarcosis. And we can see the multiple cystic lesions in the spinal canal in this patient with thin wall enhancement, both uh, in the uh, lower lumbar spine and thoracic spine. So a favorite topic of mine within spine infection is this issue of early detection of suspected spine infection. Let's look at a case. This patient presents with neck pain, fever, that is acute, uh, infection is suspected. They also have a history of endocarditis uh, involving the aortic valve. So we get loads of clinical information in this case. I, I thought that was a blessing. And if we look carefully at these T1, uh, T2 and inversion recovery images on in the sagittal plane, we can again see that there, there's abnormal signal at the uh, C56 level in the end plate, and we see focal signal change in the end plates proper. Contrast is given with fat to press technique, and we can see the extensive enhancement again within the end plate in this patient, because remember, that's where hematogenous infection goes first. So that's where we will first see the early changes of, uh, related to hematogenous spread in, in the end plate. So we see signal change and enhancement change in the vertebral end plate. In this case, also the sed rate and the C-reactive protein were markedly abnormal and the blood cultures were also positive. Another patient presents with a history of low back pain. Now that's kind of a broad term. We see a uh, lateral radiograph on the left looks fairly uh, unremarkable, was read as normal. Uh, we look at the MRI T1 
uh, and T2 sizable images on the right side. And we can identify low signal within the L5 S1 end plate on T1. Notice that the line along the end plate is partially uh, attenuated compared to the, the, the end plate uh, thin lines above at other levels, and that there's abnormal signal in the end plate as well as loss of the internuclear cleft at that L5S1 level in this patient. That scan was read as reactive end plate change or degenerative disc disease. Three weeks later, the patient still has low back pain. Do you notice that that level is not looking so healthy? The disease process has advanced because there's further progression of infection. There's greater destruction of the end plate. We lose those end plate lines at L5S1, where you're losing this base height. There's abnormal signal. You can see the infection growing through uh, the end plate into the disc, and now enhancement that's very striking on either side of the end plate with these pathologic swirls nodes, if you will, developing at that level at three weeks. Um, and this was read again as degenerative this disease um, at, an, uh, at an outpatient uh, imaging center. Now we're at 10 weeks. The patient is in severe pain, gets imaged, and now you can see the market change that's occurred in the spine. This is the initial scan. And now here we are 10 weeks later, and we have further destruction of the disc and end plate complex, abnormal enhancement. We have paraspinal soft tissue involvement with prevertebral fluid collection, destruction of the, um, the disc end plate that is even obvious now on the plain a radiographic image shown on the right at L5 S1. So that's early spine infection. Always look at the M plates, look at that M plate margin, make sure it's sharp. If it's not, you got to get concerned and do not mistake it for reactive or type one M plate change. Now, we don't make this diagnosis of spine infection in a boy. Uh, we have to uh, think about other pathologies that can mimic spine infection as well and put it in the diagnosis in the context, as I said, of the clinical history, the, the, the clinical findings, lab findings, and ultimately microbiologic confirmation. There are several mimics such as reactive end plate change and degenerative disc disease that can definitely look exactly like spine infection. Let's look at a few. The common ones, degenerative disc disease and trauma, very common. Less common, the spondyloarthropathies and neoplastic entities. Yes, neoplastic entities. I'll show you some. So this patient, <coughs> excuse me, presents with uh, low back pain of greater than uh, six weeks duration. We look at uh, the lumbar disc level that's uh, pointed out with the orange arrow here uh, on T1 and T2 and inversion recovery images. And we see we have loss of disc base height. We have abnormal signal in the end plates. It's low signal on T1, a little brighter on T2. Uh, the interesting finding here is the relative paucity of signal abnormality within the disc. Um, and we look at the corresponding radiographic image in which we identify a very clean, sharp end plate with reactive sclerosis, osteophyte formation, and vacuum phenomena. There's no paraspinal soft tissue abnormality in this patient, and this is reactive end plate change. So again, low signal on T1, bright signal on T2, loss of this height, but we can identify a sharp end plate in these patients with degenerative disc disease. 
the findings can be quite striking. And this reactive end plate change with fibrovascular replacement can enhance. Notice the relative sparing of the disc in this patient. A key distinguishing feature with respect to reactive end plate change is the relative lack of soft tissue abnormalities, the relative absence of intradiscal enhancement, uh, the so-called claw sign on diffusion weighted imaging in which the actual end plate changes uh, show restricted diffusion and the disc is spared, and the common affected levels for degenerative disease of L4-5 and L5-S1. And so in this patient with reactive end plate change, we see the claw sign on diffusion weighted imaging. Small note formation, these are intervertebral disc herniations. And when they extend into the end plate, the disc elicits an inflammatory response from the surrounding uh, portions of the vertebral body. And that inflammatory response can actually cause edema uh, with low signal in T1, bright signal in T2, and enhancement. And we get this characteristic target sign when we perform an axial image through the Schmorl's node. And you can see the different layers of contrast enhancement on the fat suppressed axial image, creating a target like appearance in, with respect to Schmorl node formation. Again, these are often focal, they're alternating zones of intensity and enhancement, target like feature, and multiplicity is the rule. They can occur synchronously with degenerative disease as in this, the MRI in this patient on the bottom left. Uh, they can occur at successive levels and they can line up as seen on the sagittal CT reformation on a younger patient on the right within the thoracic spine, for example. Trauma. Trauma can also cause findings that can mimic spine infection. And I include both surgery, trauma, and uh, low-grade trauma, so-called neuropathic osteoarthropathy. And so this is a patient with a post-surgical disc where we see the signal and enhancement changes at the area of disc curatage. Uh, this is a different patient with spine infection in which we lose uh, the disc and plate margin, extensive signal and enhancement abnormality as compared to a post-surgical disc on the left. On the left, post-surgical, on the right, spine infection for comparison. This patient presented with severe back pain. We see low signal intensity within a vertebra. We can't even identify the adjacent disc and we get a close up view and we can see uh, T2 signal abnormality throughout the disc vertebral end plate in this patient. Certainly looks like spine infection in the 60 year old male with severe back pain. And it shows extensive enhancement and even enhancement within the epidural space in this patient. Uh, we had difficulty communicating uh, with the patient due to a language barrier. Uh, we ultimately find out that he was recently involved in an accident. When you look at a plain radiograph uh, of the spine at that level, we can clearly identify a fracture through that uh, lower thoracic uh, vertebral body responsible for the signal abnormality. So this was a vertebral fracture mimicking spine infection. 80-year-old female with severe back pain, we can identify disc and plate changes at two levels. And we identify this rounded area of low signal on T1, well circumscribed bright signal on T2 involving one of the vertebra. We look uh, at the corresponding thoracic spine radiograph and identify osteoporosis with no loss of height. And what we end up determining in this patient because they have a prior vertebral compression fracture and an osteopenic spine, uh, this patient indeed has an osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture. Another patient with two areas of signal, two adjacent vertebrae with signal abnormality, loss of height, intervening signal increase in the adjacent disc as indicated by the arrow. And we look at the corresponding radiograph, which shows a vertebra plana at that level in a patient with an osteoporotic uh, 
placebo compression fraction, not only at that level, but at the level above. Um, and so it's important to remember that uh, patients uh, who have these uh, traumatic fractures, whether they have a normal spine or an osteoporotic spine, uh, that the MR appearance uh, can simulate infection. And certainly the helpful clues are the clinical history and access to prior imaging studies, including the plain radiographs. Plain radiographs are very valuable in evaluating these patients. This is a patient who was bedridden for six months. These are sagittal and coronal reformations of the, of the spine. The patient's set rate and C-reactive protein were elevated. They had an elevated prostate-specific antigen as well. So a lot of things were going on. It's a very sclerotic-looking uh, uh, spine. We, we see a lot of changes going on. Nevertheless, there was a, a, a concern for, for infection at the thoracolumbar junction in this patient. And uh, the imaging study really showed uh, some low signal intensity because of this marrow replacement process. Um, the bottom line here was that uh, this was a, uh, a non-union type of injury to the disc complex com complex in this patient that mimicked a spine infection. The diffusion image was negative. And so to a certain extent, that was a neuropathic spine. And these neuropathic spines can look exactly um, and mimic spine infection. The important clues are definitely the clinical history and getting access to prior studies in these patients in order to exclude that diagnosis. Another big category are the inflammatory spondyloarthropathies, And these imaging findings can also simulate infection with uh, end plate destruction, uh, loss of disc space height, uh, they can involve one or more components of the vertebral column, and they have an indolent or delayed presentation, just like spine infection. And so this is an example of a patient with dialysis-associated spondyl arthropathy, and this looks like all the world, just like spine infection, with destruction of the end plate, uh, abnormal signal in the disc, and an irregular uh, appearance, both with respect to signal change, uh, we used to give contrast in these cases, and they would enhance. The clue now is the absence of contrast used because these patients have um, are on dialysis, and we avoid giving them uh, gadolinium uh, for their study. And this was a patient that had been given gadolinium. This was a case from a few years back, but you could see what the enhancement abnormality would look like in these patients. And you would agree with me, this looks like all the world, just like spine infection. Another patient, uh, lumbar spine shows low signal on T1 at the end plates, loss of that end plate margin. Uh, we actually can see the end plate margin going through it. Look like Schmorl's notes almost. There's enhancement on, other, on either side, very prominent, and even a little bit of enhancement at the disc. Uh, this was biopsied and turned out to be dialysis-associated spondyloarthropathy again an early case, uh, as we can tell, because contrast was given in this case. Other situations uh, and other types of spondyloarthropathies, the T1 sagittal and the T2 sagittal image on this patient are glaringly abnormal with foci of low and high signal. The, the high signal is very subtle. The enhancement abnormalities are subtle as well, but they involve both the end plates and even the posterior elements. And on the CT scan, we can see very well circumscribed juxtaarticular and periarticular erosive changes in a patient with gouty arthritis involving the spinal axis. I mentioned earlier that neoplastic conditions can simulate spine infection. In this particular case, we can see that there's a, a focal lesion in the posterior vertebral body of the cervical spine with an associated uh, enhancing epidural component and spinal cord uh, compression. And this is a patient uh, with lymphoma, not spine infection. Patients with adjacent level involvement of neoplastic disease. 
Again, marrow replacement, low signal on T1, bright signal on T2, heterogeneous enhancement. Kind of looks like spine infection, except there's relative sparing of the, of the intervening intervertebral disc. Um, and this is a patient with metastatic prostate scan cancer. And here the scalp sagittal is very useful for that. So if we centralize this uh, infectious spondylitis category and we put the various other differential diagnostic possibilities in terms of categories around it, trauma, neoplasm, spondyloarthropathy, spondylosis, we can see that their common uh, thread of, of networking is through that end plate. So any of these other conditions can involve the end plate and that's where spine infection occurs. And that's why we get this uh, simulation in terms of imaging finding and this mimic effect that's important to be aware of. So we've diagnosed um, uh, our, our, our spine infection patient. We want to minimize delays in the diagnosis. We've performed our imaging evaluation. And in certain cases, we may be required to perform a biopsy, uh, which is image guided, in order to guide antibiotic therapy. And to this point, I try to perform these biopsies urgently because I want to do it before they start the antibiotics. These new antibiotics are very powerful and really can uh, give you a negative uh, uh, specimen with respect to microbiologic uh, confirmation. So I try to treat these as urgent uh, procedures and I try to get my clinical team to just wait just a little bit before starting their generic powerful antibiotics because they want to treat to prevent relapse. These patients are often committed to a six week course of parental, parental antibiotic therapy. Uh, the goal is to prevent spinal deformity, and neurologic compromise. Surgery for these patients is reserved uh, either for open biopsy, where repeat percutaneous biopsies at least times two have been negative, um, and to treat uh, in order to reverse neurologic compromise, to correct spinal deformity, and to uh, reestablish uh, spinal stability. So, this patient uh, who presented with an epidural abscess in the upper cervical spine underwent surgery uh, to stabilize the spine. And you can see the marked correction of the deformity, obviously the clearing of the infection. And this patient uh, was treated with uh, successfully, uh, not only with surgery, but with successful parenteral antibiotic therapy. Our patient earlier with the delay in diagnosis a spine infection at L5S1, uh, underwent successful uh, posterior spinal fusion and, and uh, as well as anterior spinal fusion um, with the treatment for spine infection and successful parenteral antibiotic uh, therapy for that condition. So what are our takeaways? Number one, uh, our clinical presentation often can be nonspecific. Our pathophysiology, we have to think about the source of infection, whether it's pre-existing, acquired, or iatrogenic. The spread of infection, either direct or hematogenous. Hematogenous, again, the vertebral end plate and possibly the uh, epidural space uh, within the spinal canal. And again, end arterial is located in the vertebral end plate in adult. That's why we look at that end plate. Early diagnosis is an important prognostic factor, and we need to base that diagnosis on a triad of clinical suspicion, abnormal laboratory parameters, and abnormal imaging findings. Contrast enhanced MRI or unenhanced MRI are deemed usually appropriate by ACR appropriateness criteria for diagnosing spine infection. We might reserve FDG PET for patients who cannot undergo MRI, those patients we can also perform gallon with spec imaging. The treatment again is parenteral antibiotic therapy for these patients. Surgery is reserved uh, for either open biopsy and often for decompression and or spinal stabilization. 
Again, the diagnosis of spine infection is based upon the triad of clinical suspicion, imaging correlation, and identification of the offending organism. In conclusion, diagnosing spine infection is a challenge, both for the clinicians and radiologists. The diagnosis begins with clinical suspicion, not only by the clinician, but by the radiologist who is thinking like a clinician. So you gotta look at that, at that medical record and you gotta get the information. And understanding the pathophysiology is extremely important because it tells you where to look and it helps you to know where to look. And if you carefully review the clinical presentation, uh, you might be able to suggest other non-infectious causes of back pain. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz, for that very insightful lecture. Um, it was very, very enriching. Uh, we do have um, a couple of questions. Awesome. Um, the first two, uh, should I go ahead? Sure. So the first one is by Enrique. Uh, so he wants to know that in early de detection of MR of infection, do we prefer MRI or gammography? Which? So he wants to know if we use MRI or gammography in early the detection. MRI, I think, is, 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 is the preferred examination, number one, uh, because it's very sensitive. But number two, it gives you that anatomic information that you need to guide management. And, you know, especially in, in certain hosts, for example, patients who um, I, IV drug users, self-injection, you really want to do an MRI because you want to exclude an epidural uh, abscess because those, depending on their extent, may require, uh, you know, a surgical uh, consultation and surgery for decompression. So I have another, I have a question as an extension of that. Um, are there any situations where we'd prefer gammography or MRI? Um, yes, yes. Well, certainly, uh, number one, if the patient can't have an MRI, right. <laughs> form of the test, and that test will be probably a combination of CT and nuclear medicine. Um, the, the, uh, the other situation is, uh, patients who have an instrumented spine, it can be challenging to, to perform a good quality MR in those situations. And you may be, it may be necessary uh, to perform um, a, a, a nuclear medicine type study. Yeah. Uh, the third one is uh, you're looking at an MRI in a patient who's been treated. You're trying to decide if they have you know, recurrent infection. You're not sure. You know the MR is going to look abnormal. And in those scenarios, uh, maybe an FDG PET study or something like that might be uh, particularly helpful to follow their clinical course. And then another question on that topic. You mentioned that um, Jacobi has moved away from using indium towards gallium. Are there any reasons to use indium? Um, any particular special situations um, that we well, need? We, we're here at, at our institution. We, we moved away from it completely for, the, for, for spine infection because we just haven't found it helpful. And, and it's in the current uh, guidelines for the appropriateness criteria, we've also moved away from it. Um, we will, indium, however, is great for um, uh, extra spinal you know, joint and other MSK type infections, especially the chronic ones. And that's where it's helpful. So there are extra, extra spinal areas where certainly that, that modality is still extremely helpful and useful. And then we have one more question. Um, is dialysis spondylodiscitis related to myeloid deposition? Oh, yes, it is. It's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a amyloid type. It's, it's beta 2 uh, microglobulin deposition in the end plate. So this is this is also like some of the other spondyloarthropathies, uh, you know, not just only an inflammatory disease, but a deposition disease that's causing um, an, an inflammatory uh, uh, reaction. 
Um, great. So that's all for the questions. Uh, I think you are done with them. Um, we do have a thank you message uh, from Dr. Obieto. He says it's a, it was an excellent topic and a great contribution of knowledge. And thank you very much. I, 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 I'm grateful for the, uh, for the kind words and, and, and for attention because this is a, a, you know, a, a, a worldwide diagnostic challenge, not just something here. And, and, and uh, uh, you just got to be alert. You always have to be alert and, and can't assume a, a, a patient is having back pain just because they have degenerative disease. And especially, you know, think about the host and really get that, get that history when you can. And, you know, my here at Jacoby, uh, we're, we're an inner city hospital in the Bronx. We work in, an, in, in New York City, which is a poor city. Uh, we have people from all over the world living in this area. Um, any case that comes through with spine infection, that, or rather with, with a low back pain or back pain that comes to our imaging attention, we put spine infection on the radar automatically. And, and right. I have to, I, ha I ask myself the question, why isn't this spine infection, you know, as opposed to uh, yeah. why is this degenerative disease? So yeah. that helps me to avoid the pitfalls of, of falling into the traps, if you will. And, and, and as, as you mentioned, it's a worldwide problem. So I do remember a case from when I was an intern back in India. We had a, an older patient with POTS disease and um, the history was very important in figuring out what was going on. So, yeah. Yes, yes, critical. Thank you so much for reemphasizing that. So, and so that's all. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz, for being here teaching us. Um, it was a pleasure having you and learning from you. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. My pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thank you.